Okay, thanks so much, Jose. Welcome, everybody. Kim Bancroft is here today, and she is the great great granddaughter of the library's founder, Hubert Howe Bancroft. She says that she is thrilled to have set free the archives of Bancroft's second wife, Matilda, along with those of his first wife, Emily, making their stories available in her book, Writing Themselves into History, Emily and Matilda Bancroft in Journals and Letters. Kim first visited the library with her parents and her older brother at age eight on a tour with then director Jim Hart, who first alerted Kim to her great great grandmother's diaries. Over several decades, Kim forgot about them, understandably, while earning her teaching credential, her master's degree, her PhD, and then teaching in high schools and colleges. In 2008, Kim finally returned to the library to begin spending time with family history. And she's very thankful today to Teresa Salazar, the curator of Western Americana, for making her aware of these valuable stories tucked away in the archives. In fact, Kim invited Teresa to help store, help tell the story of how this book came into being. Kim. Thank you. Yes, thank you to Christine and to Jose Adrian for inviting me and to all of the Bancroft Library staff and supporters who keep this amazing institution serving the public. I have a land acknowledgement that I'd like to make that I speak from the unceded territory of Pomo people where I live. May we never forget our debt. So I want to begin with how this book came to be. And that includes an image here of Matilda Bancroft's 1876 diary. This book would not have happened were it not for Teresa Salazar, curator of Western Americana. I tell the story in my introduction that following the renovation of the library in 2008, Teresa was standing by this book, an open copy of Matilda's diary, and she told me unforgettably, Kim, you should come in here and read your great-great-grandmother's writing. She was a writer in her own right. So I'd now like to invite Teresa to give her perspective on introducing me to Matilda and her diaries, and I hope Teresa will also elaborate on her work as a curator and how she helps other folks like me utilize collections in significant ways. Teresa. Thank you folks. Uh, so I'm not gonna take up too much of the time, but I actually am gonna begin with how I sort of discovered Matilda's uh, uh, writing. So, um, you know, she has so many important works that are embedded in, in the, the Bancroft's collection. And I first discovered her, and I think Kim might allude to this during the talk, uh, through the dictations that she uh, helped with. And so the, these dictations, so for folks who don't know them, are sort of like an early form of oral history where you sit down with somebody and talk through, through their history. So what Matilda's, I think, amazing contribution in terms of, since she worked on other dictations as well, but uh, the ones that she did with Mormon women, and, and I really think those are especially of note because had Matilda not done them, I don't think we would have the voices of, of those women. So I think that's an incredibly important contribution that, that um, um, Matilda made to the whole uh, process of taking down these dictations. Uh, so uh, another way I sort of found more out about Matilda was uh, I, uh, there, there was this diary, but there was also another diary that sort of piqued my interest, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's called um, Our Winter in Mexico, and it dates from 1891. And so it records this trip that the family took down uh, from uh, their, their home in, in California. They boarded a train in Martinez and went all the way down, eventually landing up in Mexico City uh, to be hosted by Porfirio Diaz. So what I like about this is that it's very detailed in terms of what is unfolding uh, in terms of their trip. And it's also um, illustrated, sort of extra illustrated by her son, Paul Bancroft, who contributes photographs. And it's the combination is just really wonderful because you see her commentary and her sort of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, seeing him as a collaborator. You can see that definitely in, in what she writes, um, encouraging him to take photographs. So um, 
that to give you a sense of the detail, you know, they begin in Martinez boarding this train and they have, you know, mountains of luggage. I mean, we think we take a lot of luggage if we take two or three items. They had a massive amount of luggage that they were trying to put onto this train in Martinez. Uh, they wanted to leave on time, she mentions, uh, but, you know, they were going to be gone for months. And so obviously they had to pack accordingly. And I also think in the 19th century, they did pack much more extensively than, than you know, Teresa likes to take a backpack. And mm -hmm. if anything, just one carry on, that's all, you know, so, so just having her describe this whole process is really interesting. So, so it, it, you know, she, it really literally goes to, you know, when they get to Arizona, when they reach the border in El Paso, um, you know, you can, she talks a little bit about that border crossing. Uh, and then the things that they do along the way, you know, the towns, the crops, the, the mining that's going on, till finally they, they, they have this big celebration when they meet with Porfirio Diaz. So it's a really um, interesting, diary and you know it just gave me um, a window into sort of Matilda's uh work but but I think you know, I do want to point out that you know there is a lot of Matilda's writing in the Bancroft collection and that was left for Kim to discover and she's going to talk about that there is so much there I mean I, I have, I'm always amazed at you know the, the the record that she leaves because it's it's all sorts of things it's both personal, but also professional. And I, I think you can see her amazing contributions. She was a wonderful mother, but she also wanted to be engaged in uh, what the, the library company was doing. Uh, so, so definitely uh, you get that. Uh, Kim's gonna talk a little bit more about that. So Kim talked, wanted me to talk a little bit about what you know I do as a curator uh, in terms of helping researchers. And um, so, you know, um, we definitely, you know, lots of people reach out to us via email or in the reading room, uh, and they can range from students here on the campus to, you know, people, international researchers. You know, we've had a lot of people, we have this one collection that re relates to the, the, the Gadar movement in India. We've had international people from India and England reach out to us about those types of collections. But we also have a lot of, you know, obviously local users, and I work mainly with people interested in uh, in Western history. Um, and, you know, and I think some of them, are, like my relationship to Kim is this long extended one. So I've, uh, I've also worked with uh, professors and uh, instructors with these long term relationships. And some of those are the most fulfilling because, you know, um, they discover things, we share things, you know, and I get to know more about the collections from what their discoveries are. And oftentimes I'm at the surface, so I see lots of things. And that's why I feel, I feel my role is to let people know more about them. And once in a while, I get to dig deeper, uh, like we currently have a, a map exhibit now, so I got to spend more time researching those. But really it's, um, I vicariously experience this thing, uh, this research uh, enterprise through the people that I work with, and it's it's a, it's it's very very fulfilling. So, I do want to turn this uh, over to to uh, to Kim so she can sort of launch her talk, and we might have a little bit more give and take uh, as we go through the through the presentation. Kim, all right. Well, thank you, Teresa. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned that diary because I had a whole chapter on Matilda's diary about their trip to Mexico and it didn't make it into the book, but I'll bring it up again. So you can see how Teresa's depth of experience with the archives, especially in this case, Matilda's really helped promote my ability to do this research. So I'll return to my writing story. And I first want to share the pleasure of using primary sources, something perhaps many of you can relate to. Reading through Matilda's diaries was spectacular for me, seeing how she expressed herself and talked about her experiences, like how she described her first child pictured here, my great grandfather, Paul, and places they had traveled to, places that still remain in our family lore. So it was a joyful discovery to see her talking about these and a little spooky too. But 
when I started reading Matilda's diaries, I also learned about people and places I'd never heard of, like Sister Kate. I remembered H.H. and Matilda's daughter, Lucy, but I'd never heard of Kate. I knew the Ruth Bancroft Garden in Walnut Creek and had been there, but I'd never heard of Helix Farms in Spring Valley outside San Diego. So I first went to our useful, if often suspect, Dr. Google, as Charles Fallhaber calls him, to look up some of these places and people. And here's what I found when I looked up Spring Valley, the Bancroft Ranch House Museum, which turns out to be the, the home that um, Matilda and H.H. made for their family as they were creating a ranch there. I also knew that H.H. had written an autobiography. So here's the autobiography of, from 1890 Literary Industries that I went to, and he provided lots more answers and lots more questions. There, I learned that he'd had a prior wife, Emily. So I followed her trail to her papers at UC San Diego, which Teresa had also alerted me to. They were in their special collections and archives then called the Mandeville. And at my first opportunity, I physically showed up to sit there and turn Emily's onion skin pages and transcribe from them. Again, another amazing experience. I marveled at Emily's 1860s news and information, her sense of humor, how she cherished her daughter, her mournful longings for her family back home in Buffalo. It was all very real and thrilling. This portal into the past also provided a journey of discovery for me as the family tree continued to grow. And the family tree also, um, I'll show you here, of course, all of this journey was very personal because it was my family. You can see here at the, the top of the family is Azariah, Ashley, and Lucy Howe, the progenitors. Hubert Howe was tucked in among his brothers and sisters. Emily, his first wife, had daughter Kate with Hubert. Emily died in 1869. And then in 1876, Matilda came along and they had their four children, Paul, Griffin, Philip, and Lucy. And so I come from the Paul Bancroft side. So of course, I, I was feeling very connected to four and five generations of this family that were channeling these stories. But I also had a weird sense that some of these ancestors hoped someone would come along and appreciate the information they'd saved. I wondered if I'd been chosen in some kind of odd lottery in the beyond to be the one to do something substantive with these archives, and I hope others will as well. An unfortunate reality, I'll say, is that too few of us care deeply about our family history, maybe any history, to do the research and make sense of it. Um, I might comment that as a society, we seem challenged today by adhering to historical fact, but also as individuals, we're very busy. We have work and family. And I myself didn't really pay attention to this family history until Teresa told me to come in and pay attention. I was age 50, I'd spent 30 years teaching. So I understand that the present can often take too much of our time to be thinking about the past. So you know, what makes someone pick up the historical baton and carry it forward? might take somebody like Teresa, who says the right words at the right time. And for some of us, we've been touched by Cleo, the history muse, and it becomes incumbent upon us to do something about learning about that history, get into this historical sleuthing, whether for the family or for our community or for the larger society. So whatever it is, it's great when it happens. And once I started reading these primary sources, I got the history mania. And it wasn't just for my family, but for understanding the importance of what Emily and Matilda were conveying about life from women's perspective in the late 19th century. The primary sources also have this great allure. I often hear professors and curators say, come in here, get, bring your students in here so they see these primary sources and use them. And I probably don't need to say to this audience, there's something quietly spectacular in having this connection to the past. I mean, 
this is the paper that Emily wrote on. And these pages traveled across the country by steamer and eventually returned to California safely. This is the book that Matilda inscribed her family's life in. And so it's very special to be able to have that physical connection. But I wanna speak about a few other sources and more joy of historical detective work. Ultimately, my emphasis for the book was having Matilda and Emily's voices heard first and foremost. And so I wanted to save as much room for them and their stories, which meant carefully deciding what other historical information to include and exclude. This is something writers of all kinds, of course, uh, face these decision points about what you can include. There's so much information that's coming at us and it's valuable. But here's a little bit of what I used in my research and some of which made it into the book. Census documents were really fun. They helped round out information that Emily and Matilda were providing about other family members, for example, who were living with them or visiting how old they were, how much money they had available. This is the census information I found out about HH's older brother, Curtis, and his son, Will, who show up frequently in Emily's stories and in Matilda's and were, um, this was kind of like the thrilling triangulation to see them on the census. Sanborn maps are also really instructive. Charles Fallhaber, one of my superior editors for this project, found these maps online, which allowed me to see the Bancroft's homes on these maps. And this San Diego map was kind of fun. According to Matilda, one of the HH's siblings had started the Southwest Institute School. And on this map, I found the school close to where HH and Matilda had built a home. This information did not enter into the book, but it, it was instructive. Even more personal information came from some of the holdings in the Bancroft Library. And again, along the family tree, there were oral histories, including one from Philip Bancroft uh, Sr., the third son of H.H. and Matilda, who became a prominent farmer and political figure in Walnut Creek. And it's uh, at that property where the Ruth Bancroft Garden is. Another oral history that was really interesting came from Margaret Wood Bancroft, who was the second wife of Griffin Bancroft. And she was quite a character. I got to know great aunt Margaret when I was a child. She and um, Griffin married in 1917 and had uh, one year of living with HH before he died. And so I discovered too, through um, also through Teresa, that her oral history there, of course, had information that she had shared about Matilda. She hadn't gotten to know her. Matilda died in 1910. But what she said was really important in terms of understanding Matilda's character. And in effect, talked about how Matilda suffered in relation to HH's demanding life and needs. What Matilda said of the couple, he was very active. And this is what Margaret said of the couple. He was very active and he had this bad asthma. When it would come on him in San Francisco, he'd have his horse saddled, ride it down to the ferry, go across the bay and ride all the way to Walnut Creek, which took him part of the day. Then Matilda would follow in the buckboard with the driver or tutor and the children. It was a hard life for her and she was very small. They always had to put a box under her feet because she, her feet couldn't get down to the ground. And then what Teresa was referring to, Margaret included this interesting note about Matilda's writing projects. You can read that book I found there at the farm about their visit to Mexico. So that was the 1892 diary called Our Winter in Mexico that Margaret had found on the shelves in the Walnut Creek home. She made sure that that book and so many other Bancroft family papers got into the Bancroft library, including a whole slew of letters from her husband, Griffin. And she did the same with Emily's collected letters, which were in Southern California with Emily's descendants there. So Margaret wins the prize as a tremendous guardian angel of the archives. Now her 
Margaret's final words in this oral history about Matilda's diaries and projects were kind of prophetic. She said, you can see the energy that Matilda put into those things, but it wore her out. I think she was in her early 60s when she died. And in fact, she was 62 when she died in 1910. And here she is with my great grandfather, Paul, Paul Bancroft Jr. Well, speaking of oral histories, and, and Teresa also was the one who introduced these to me, Matilda was involved in over 20 uh, oral histories of early pioneers. And some, as she mentioned, were of the Latter-day Saints women, like this one, Jane Snyder Richards, who reported to Matilda her experiences in the early days of Mormon resettlement. Now, these oral histories weren't Matilda's words, but they represent her work and experience. And that was another means for me to understand her. From these documents, I could glean what Matilda had learned, the kind of education I think she'd received from hearing these stories, and perhaps all the more so because she was writing them down herself. Throughout our research and uh, work as writers, we try to imagine the internal experiences of what others describe and report. I had a most relevant personal source in H.H. Bancroft's autobiography, Literary Industries. I wanted to incorporate his stories about Emily and Matilda, and he revealed, of course, key information about who they were. In addition to his genuine love for his wives, his perspective was vital for seeing how they had um, created a, a home environment in which he could work. He appreciated their intelligence. And in Matilda's case, it was clear that she had helped him with his work, his research and writing. The letters that are at the Bancroft Library between Matilda and HH were also important sources for understanding their relationship and how they communicated and what her experience was within the family. In the letters that were saved between HH and Griffin, for example, he conveyed to his sons how he felt they should be listening to their mother's advice. Other sources included the family photos, which were a, a trove, a precious trove that not many families have going back to the 1870s and 80s. And um, this one is called The Founding of a Family. So again, I felt very touched by prior generations who wanted this stuff to be saved and valued. And that became particularly important when I figured out that someone in a later generation had curated this album that clearly Matilda had initiated. The handwriting on the left under the four, four children is Matilda's, but you can see the handwriting in the photo on the right is slightly different. And I think it must have come from either Anne Bancroft Graham uh, a daughter of, of Philip Bancroft or Louise, who's featured here, my great grandmother. Um, but in any case, the intent was to continue the tradition of clarifying family history for future generations. And I uh, side note here, when I spoke at the California Historical Society and mentioned the importance of saving family papers and photos, Bill Deverell, the USC historian commented that we must label photos so future generations know who the heck these people are. I know who my mother is in these photos, but who will know in 60 or 100 years if we aren't identifying people? So, so um, beware. Another source for me was the amazing 89 pages of genealogy and family history written by Matilda, also at the Bancroft Library. It had so much information, too much to include in much depth, but again, another indication of how Matilda herself was a historian, writing these stories of different family branches, not just individuals, but the whole branch that she must have researched meticulously. So those are some of my many sources. We throw out a net to catch whatever we can and sort through it over years, perhaps, to figure out what will ultimately go into the final book. And as I said, so much of it, the photos, diaries, letters did not make the final narrative cut, but I, a lot did make it into the book. 
So I want to talk for a few minutes about my actual writing process and a few decision points along the way. The first step was to categorize themes and topics. And I learned this organizational feat in a big way when I was working on my dissertation at the Graduate School of Education at Cal with my wonderful advisors, Dr. Jabari Mahiri and Dr. Bruce Fuller. I had conducted research at three charter schools for over a year observing classrooms and school-wide events. And I interviewed students, principals, teachers, um, parents, all to analyze the socioeconomic context and how it affected each school. So I had a phenomenal amount of information to sift through and organize into subtopics. And that was a really wonderful preparation for researching and writing this book. Now you can see here briefly my files for Emily and Matilda where I'd copied from the transcripts and other sources to create documents of similar information according to subtopics. Eventually, I drew from these to organize my presentation of their stories into chapters. And first, regarding Emily, I thought about presenting a chronological perspective, moving through her letters as she was settling into San Francisco, making a life for herself, pre presenting the information as she did little by little over time. But her way of communicating was a bit ha happenstance. She'd start on Monday, write a little bit, a little bit more on Tuesday, reporting something that happened each day, what they had for lunch, or looking for an, a new girl to help out, um, a visitor who came. So it didn't seem very cohesive. And I felt that context was often needed. Who were these people that cropped up in these places she referred to, the political event that she reported? So instead, I decided, and I hope it was a good decision, to present the information by moving from the personal at an individual in her life out into um, the larger world. So I began in chapter one with she and Hubert and their daughter, their relationship at home and making a home environment. And then the next chapter, I moved out to embrace their household, including family members. That's where I got to talk about the many family members they cared about, serving girls and others who came into their lives. Then came the larger society around them in chapter three, including news of the, the time, Emily's depictions of what was going on in San Francisco, politically and nationally, including the Civil War. The next chapter literally moved further out into their travels as far as Europe. And finally came Emily's illness, which I saw as a mystery that had been building up. And this is the only photo of Emily, by the way, that I have seen. Um, she, she was talking little by little in every, in every letter about something that was plaguing her. And so I needed other research, of course, to understand Emily's demise, what was the forensic trail of what was happening to her. I had found topics in her writing about the impact of headaches connected to sugar consume or later symptoms of wasting, fatigue, loss of eyesight. So I asked around and sought someone to inform me and landed on the endocrinologist, Dr. Ryan Lal at Stanford. I sent him quotations from Emily's writing and her photo. It turned out that he'd been an undergraduate at Cal many years ago and fondly rem remembered studying in the old Bancroft Library reading room. So he was all the happier to help me out. And then he confirmed what I'd suspected that Emily probably had untreated diabetes, but he also no noticed the goiter on her neck there, which I had not. And that probably indicated thyroid problems. So he helped explain why Emily also lost at least two newborn babies as a probable result of diabetes. So that, that was a tragic story there. As for Matilda's uh, chapters, I organized the information gathered around her multiple roles as writer, traveler, mother, teacher, oral historian, businesswoman. And I concluded my last chapter on her about Matilda's most personal role, her relationship with Hubert, 
circling back to how I started the book with Emily and Hubert in chapter one. Now, some of these ideas for chapters relating to Matilda's roles were invited by chronology, the first describing her marriage and her soon becoming a mother, but others of these roles were sparked by topics in her writing. And Teresa had called Matilda a writer in her own right, which made me think a lot, who, who is a writer? Is it somebody who's been published and acknowledged by the outside world? Well, all the writing that Matilda did indicates that she was a writer and HH utilized her writing in his work, in fact. So that was yet another way of seeing her as a writer. So a chapter on that topic. HH had called her a good businessman, quote unquote, and much of what Matilda wrote about was how she was handling family properties, indicating she was an excellent businesswoman. So I committed a chapter to real estate and other projects that she helped manage. And lastly, as, as Teresa said, she took amazing dictations. And though HH never officially called her his assistant, she clearly enjoyed this work. We don't know if she was the one who suggested that she take the dictations of the Latter-day Saints women, but um, she clearly made herself indispensable in that. So I'm going to conclude with a couple of other decision points that I wrestled with deeply in writing this book. And one is a question of privacy that came up, a concern for privacy. Emily actually wrote private, as you can see at the top of this page, on some of her letters. One of Emily's great, great, uh, great granddaughters is still living in La Jolla, California. When I met her years ago, she was uneasy about allowing any of those letters to appear in the book that I was um, over meeting her a couple of years, clearly beginning to write. One 1864 letter concerned the death of Emily's newborn baby. And that happened within two hours of the baby's death. Emily spoke of using a puppy to draw off her mother's milk from her engorged breast. Emily's descendant at first felt that that letter had been marked private to protect Emily from improper exposure and should not have even been in that binder of letters and made public. She was not too happy with H.H. Bancroft about that. But ultimately, the same descendant agreed that Emily's letter and the other letters marked private might provide some historical information useful to understand how women coped in the aftermath of the loss of their baby. And lastly, another topic that I sought to address in a sensitive way was dealing with sexism and racism in this family's writing. My goal was to acknowledge references that today we interpret as sexist or racist, whether the remarks emerge from ignorance or malice, but I didn't want to expound too heavily and get off topic. It's a difficult decision point, but I did want to show these characters for better and for worse as complex and contradictory participants in the history of their time in light of our own time. So that meant pointing out late 19th century taken for granted notions that were foundational to sex, sexism and racism that's systematic then and still today. So rather than shy away from racism, I found it intriguing and horrifying and necessary to see it at work in common letters and reports from that time. There wasn't, um, there was enough to, to make some comments on. For example, Emily wrote about Indian disturbances that had prevented letters from arriving in June, 1863. I wrote, how detached Emily, like many Americans seems from news of Indian unrest. In reality, vicious battles against Native Americans raged across the West with the aim of Indian removal, if not annihilation of those who refused to be marched off to a reservation. People such as Emily presumed the manifest destiny of their ownership of the whole country and so little noticed these tragic struggles. Another example was Matilda's reference to H.H. H. Bancroft's parents, Apache girl, whom they named Susan and whose grave is pictured here with the words adopted and redeemed. 
Where did she come from? What was her story? I was fortunate to have delivered into my inbox from the curators of the Bancroft Library, a note from Patricia Prestonary, the university archivist at Cal State Fullerton. They just discovered a diary there that had belonged to H.H. H. Bancroft's father, Azariah Ashley, in which he had written that he and his wife, Lucy, had adopted an Apache girl, now named Susan, who was much beloved. Unfortunately, she died a few years later from tuberculosis. I tried to find out what might have happened to Susan's Indian family and learned that likely they had been decimated by General Crooks in one of his anti-Indian campaigns. I wanted to address what it meant for an Apache girl to be redeemed by white Christians as well-meaning as they were. There's a whole history of forced Indian assimilation that accompanies this one example. So incorporating that kind of research and owning the impacts of racism within one's own ancestries, I believe is important, just as is elaborating on the truly positive achievements and accomplishments that these ancestors have contributed to society. So I hope that learning about Emily and Matilda's works does become a positive means for all readers to educate ourselves about the many facets of late 19th century life, and what women like Emily and Matilda were facing as they were trying to forward their own lives in the family and far beyond. So that's how this book came to be. And perhaps I'll, uh, Teresa, if you have any further comments, that would be great. And otherwise, I'll take questions from people in the audience. I do want to make one comment on how much we appreciate you mentioning how photographs um, need to be annotated because they are essentially, if, you know, they may be wonderful images, but if you don't have a context, that's really a, a real loss, you know, they can't even be used. Uh, whereas a manuscript, you can usually tease out a context with photographs. If you don't have that, I think that's really critical. And I just wanted also to make one comment, you know, about like what doesn't make it to the books and, you know, but it, but it moves you. Do you have any particular instances where something you discovered was very meaningful to you, but didn't necessarily make it into like a general narrative? Well, I actually, I did have a whole chapter um, of of Matilda's book, Our Winter in in Mexico, and I enjoyed pruning through that wonderful diary and trying to find instances of what she was explaining about how they saw Mexican society and and Native people, Indians in the Southwest, as they were traveling to Mexico, and again showing uh, what their ideas were about other races as well as how they were reacting to what was they were experiencing in Mexico. And so I'm really sad that that chapter didn't make it. Maybe it will get published in some other way. Um, and there were there were many smaller examples all along the way that I just I just couldn't put it all in there. Right. And again, I think what's important about that diary is also what you talked about is context. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you know, again, they have a very positive experience, but there also are derogatory terms to use for both the uh, indigenous people of Mexico or just peasants that they meet along the way. But I think re putting, acknowledging that those words and putting them in context is really critical. So, so Christine, we'll probably turn this or you or Jose to see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you, both of you, Kim. That was really quite excellent. And I think we all appreciate kind of like going behind the curtain, so to speak, and seeing the ways that you uh, selected certain things to talk about. Um, let's see, we would like to open it up for questions. So you can either um, raise your hand and unmute yourself, or if you'd like to put your question in the chat, we'd be happy to read it for you. Um, for example, Anne Harlow has put in a plug for the Institute for Historical Study, um, tihs.org. New members are always welcome. The Bancroft Roundtable was first started by Institute members, including Joanne Loeffler, who unfortunately died recently. Thank you for letting us know about that. I'm sorry. Ah, Roseanne Goodwin, thank you. Go ahead and, and ask your question. 
Well, here's my question. And that is, um, first of all, Kim, I have corresponded with you um, by email in the past when you wanted to um, participate in a Congress of History um, conference. And had I known you were doing all this work, I probably would have made space for you because it's so intriguing. Um, so that's more of a comment, I understand. But I also um, want to say that last night I attended a Casa de Oro um, planning meeting for the new library that we're going to be getting in five years. And the style, people kept suggesting the Bancroft Ranch house. And I was thinking today that more importantly, it would be the adobe next to it, you know, which is a different pro um, management because uh, the county manages the adobe, whereas um, Spring Valley Historical Society manages the farmhouse. So what what is your feeling about that? Well, I don't, I'm not uh, involved in some of those particular, I guess, politics about the management of the place. I've gone there many times to visit. And um, so that, but if you want to contact me and I have information here, uh, my website is it below, which lists all of my events and a way to contact me. I, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that in particular. Okay, I was just curious about that, and so I didn't know if they, you they've a... done a good. They did do a good job of trying to preserve the adobe building that actually preceded Matilda and HH. And so again, it was fun for me to learn about the whole history of that area. And in fact, the native people who originally had been at that spring and utilized it, and and what happened thereafter. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. And I will contact you. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have another question here from Julia Seiler who says, thank you, Kim. If Emily or Matilda were still alive and you could ask them each one question, what would those questions be? Oh, Julie Seiler, who's written in some amazing books herself using um, primary sources. I guess I would I would say to Emily, that's such a good question. Do you regret not getting your family out to visit sooner? What could you have done to make them come visit? She she loved her family back in Buffalo, and they just couldn't make it. I think uh, assume like, well, we'll get there one day. But in the 1860s, there was no transcontinental railroad. It, was finished in 1869, which is when she died. So I just wonder what she feels she might have done differently to try to get them to come visit. I think her father finally arrived about a month before she died. And that was always very sad for me in reading her writing. And for Matilda, I would say, why don't you feel you could have pushed harder to become more of a manager and leader, especially in this one particular project, she was pushing to make the that family property, Helix Farms, into a refuge, a sanitarium for the urban poor. Why couldn't you have pushed a little bit harder? And maybe that's not fair, but that's what I wanted for her. Yeah, interesting. Um, Kathleen has a question for you, which is, was there something about Matilda's character that encouraged women to open up to her? Or was it a time when people, especially immigrants to the West, um, oh, sorry, I'm disappearing, especially, Im especially immigrants to the West wanted their stories to be told? That's a good question. Um, H.H. H. actually talked about in his autobiography how his wife had sat listening attentively when he was beginning to do his oral histories back east with General Sutter and he had just married Matilda and they were still on their honeymoon and she was coming along and learning the art of doing oral histories. So H.H. talked about how attentively she sat and questions she asked. 
So I get the sense that she was a very good listener and that she was very smart and well-read and autodidact. Um, and so that she could make these women in particular, the, the Mormon women comfortable with them um, with in this situation, asking questions that were very personal about what it was like to have a plural marriage and how they felt about their husbands taking another wife. And you don't see those questions in the oral histories themselves, but you can tell that such questions were asked because that's the answer that she was able to provoke. So I, I just see her as being a, a warm person who was able to ask questions in different ways. And she had learned from H.H. H. Bancroft and his clerks how to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and kind of along the same vein, did Matilda, Camilla uh, Smith was wondering, did Matilda lobby for the chance to do interviews or did Hubert ask her to do them on his own? Yeah, I don't know. I, I just imagine that she was a, a strong enough woman to say, I could do this and I would be the appropriate person to ask these women these questions. And that he, he from the letters he wrote to his son Griffin that, that exist, you can see how much he really respected Matilda and her opinions and how much she was able to, to be a capable, competent manager in, in different ways. So I think that he was clearly happy to have her take that role. Yeah, we'd hope so. Uh, Neil Brownstein, you have your hand up. Can you unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, if I can call you Kimmy. Can I call you Kimmy? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Go back I, very I, well. was, I was wondering, what's your father, of course, he's not with us, unfortunately, what your father might observe about the California uh, coverage of the Civil War in the 1860s, which, mm -hmm. as you point out in your in your book, was uh, you know very very uh, brief. So I thought that uh, that was extremely strange. Of course, in this age of instant news, we all know what's happening everywhere in the world uh, instantly. But it just seemed to be extremely strange, and I was just wondering what you think your dad would have. Uh, uh, thought about that particular absence of uh, significant uh, coverage of the Civil War. Well, there was there were definite letters that Emily wrote about the the Civil War and the ways. And I in in the book I include some of the references when they uh, how the the bombing of ships, the destruction of ships that the Confederates did of Northern ships affected H.H. H. Bancroft's shipments, for example, that, that came, or the news that they heard from the, the South and how they were rooting for the North. So there were certainly those, uh, those letters in her collection, and I tried to include some representative, but again, there was a lot of information in all of her letters. As for my father, I mean, I think he he was always my the first supporter of the Bancroft Library in our family and made sure that we were going there and uh, loving the place and appreciating what was had been stored there. And so I think in general, I mean, he was able to read this book before he passed and made sure of that. It was writing fast when he was sick and he he appreciated all of the variety that I was trying to stuff into the book from both Emily and his great-grandmother, Matilda. It's good to see you, Neil. Thanks, well, we, we have a couple more minutes. Does anybody else have a question in the chat or they would like to uh, unmute themselves and, and ask him directly? Actually, there is one more. I'm sorry, I, I think I missed this earlier. Ann Harlow asks for suggestions on how to annotate photos. You, you know, you and Teresa both emphasize the importance of that. Do you have any common sense suggestions for that? Well, I, I think that as Bill Deverell mentioned that going through albums and, and as I saw in the album that Matilda had started and somebody else had, had added to go through and write down who are these people? What, when was this event? Was it in October, 1869? Um, who was attending this party? As much as anybody can know. And it seems a little tedious at the time, but it's also a huge 
relief for somebody 20 or 30 or 50 years from now who looks back at this and say, oh, well, that's what that's what that park looked like. That park no longer exists. It's now an apartment building, you know, um, all of the things that can happen over time that we can't even imagine or what's going to happen to our grandchildren and great grandchildren that as much writing as you can put on in pencil, that's what Bill said, on the back of the photo or in an album are really important. And nowadays too, we're taking photos on phones and we're not even printing them out to have as much. So I think that's another thing to be conscious of is taking the time at some point to say, okay, I'm gonna print out these 100 photos and write on the back of them who they are or otherwise save the digitized photos with some caption on them. Somebody yes, yes. will appreciate it in the future. I promise you. I, ah, I have a question. Yeah. So, Kim, what's next? What What are you? What's your next project? Oh, Camilla, not that question. I am. Well, actually, I'm trying to help a group here in Willits. This is one little project, and I see Naomi Wagner is on the call. Um, to promote people writing your stories and saving the information, the legacy. So I have a sort of guinea pig group here of a wonderful group of folks who have been here in Willits, where I live in the, since the 80s and have done a variety of, of activities from local theater to um, environmental activism to uh, trying to sort through the letters of, of one participant uh, between his father and mother during the Korean War, like 500 uh, letters, and how to figure out to do the same thing that I've been able to do with helping others do memoirs. So that's that's my main uh, goal right now, is helping people tell their stories and, and saving stories in whatever way possible. So thank you. That is That is what I'd love to do. Wonderful. Neil, you have one last question. We'll give you the floor real quick. Yeah, it's please. just it's just an observation. Uh, so uh, at my cousin uh, Buddy Bornstein's uh, funeral a month ago in Chicago, uh, 95 years old, patriarch of, of the family. Uh, he had a wonder, wonderful, and long and beautiful, fantastic life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it was therefore uh, relatively easy as the family came together uh, to not only talk about uh, Buddy Bornstein, but also all of the relatives and, and so forth. And, and we uh, reached for our phones, our iPhones, uh, Androids, and then we started looking at those old pictures. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and it stimulated uh, others to uh, go back in the next few days or week or whatever, uh, to gather uh, photos uh, and letters. Uh, and share them with uh, the those that had uh, that were uh, brought together. So these family events, uh, you know, weddings, births, stuff like that, and particularly uh, funerals with the uh, oldest of the generations are an excellent time uh, to say, wait a minute, let's uh, 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 spend a, a quality hour or quality two hours, whatever it is and put into action because it, it's something that uh, people will do, you know, in the next two, three, five days, but then they'll go off and, and uh, not pay much attention to these things. So those family photos, uh, which we gathered, uh, now are resident in ancestry.com uh, for uh, the uh, current and, and future generations. So they'll, they'll always be there. That's uh, great. In addition to, of course, the census figures and the, uh, the, the naturalization uh, papers, all of that is available on Ancestry that uh, is brought together by their web uh, crawlers. So it's really, really interesting yeah. to see that. Mm -hmm. I would add to that the importance of doing oral histories, like somebody turn on the video or voice memo or whatever source it is to ask people their stories because they'll remember things going back to their grandparents that are, you know, could take take someone back a hundred years. So I'm all for using oral histories now as another means to capture those stories. So thank you for that, Neil. 
Yes, thank you. And and Kim, once again, thank you. Thanks to Teresa as well for, for um, giving us this wonderful talk today. Um, speaking of oral histories, next month's roundtable will be a discussion of just that, of intergenerational trauma in Japanese American families, uh, presented by some of the oral historians here. So hopefully a lot of you can come back next month for that. Um, and we have gone over the one o'clock hour, so this talk will be available on YouTube. We'll let you all know. Thank you all so much for coming, and huge thanks again to you, Kim, for sharing your talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. Everyone.